April. Glad to be back amidst you. So some of the uh, questions that were asked, uh, you know, in the uh, session just before tea, I talked about five uh, different pathways that uh, we can sort of vaguely classify what uh, countries in the world uh, appear to have followed to take their economy from on the road to development. And the questions were, you know, what is my prescription for India among them? I didn't want to say none, but definitely we were trying to say we also uh, embarked on some of them. Having said that, what is the roadmap for India? So basically, you know, as I said right at the beginning, in the morning, I mean, at uh, 9 o'clock today, that uh, it is, uh, the idea here is to understand what are the alternate pathways available to a country and uh, how to choose a judicious mix of them, especially from um, uh, the environmental perspective. Obviously, that means since there could possibly be a trade-off between what uh, you know, uh, they would like to formulate for achieving development, high growth rate point of view and uh, from terms of uh, the environmental preservation point of view, etc. So an ideal mix of policies and strategies which is, uh, gives them win-win situation, both economic development at the same time much less uh, you know, environmental um, uh, adverse impacts is what they should choose. So that's exactly what we are trying to uh, explore now. So instead of just giving a prescription, I thought we now, uh, you know, look at it from the perspective of achieving sustainable development. Because everybody wants development, but now what we would like to have is sustainable development. And that's what even many countries in the world are now trying to achieve. But then the moment you say sustainable development, we all know what is development, but what is sustainable development? So we have to start by what this concept means. And uh, is this a myth or is it really something which is measurable, quantifiable? Because without that, most people, including social scientists, will not accept it. And then what are the approaches or strategies to achieve this? Then towards the end, we will say what exactly is in store from the Indian perspective. Again, as, a, as the, the course objective is to sort of share with you some of these uh, you know, thoughts, which can you know, help you to provoke the students, make them think and see how exactly this could be done, etc. So you know, this is what I expect to go through. In this, the concept, and then briefly I'll mention to you about you know the estimation of green GDP, which is taken as a proxy when you're talking about sustainable development. Then operationalize sustainable development. Now, development itself is a process of change, but sustainable development, more importantly, is a process of change, as most people have now come to consensus on, where the exploitation of resources, the direction of investments, the orientation of technological development and institutional changes, all that we talked about in the morning to the year around 9, are all in harmony. That is, there is no contradiction between them. They all go together and enhance both current as well as future potential to meet human needs and aspirations. So it's not simply in terms of current meeting the needs of the current population, but also in terms of the future needs and the aspirations. If that's what we can do, then we call that pathway as pathway to sustainable development. Now, to break it down further, therefore, we say that it is a process that links exploitation of resources, exploitation not necessarily in derogatory or wrong sense, the use of it, investments, how exactly you are directing your investments to, uh, the technological efforts, what kind of technology you are choice of, including choice of techniques and what of steps for R&D and innovations, etc., and kinds of institutions that you are created for achieving development. They're all, you know, keeping in mind uh, basically process that links them with the human needs and aspirations. That is, they don't draw upon a plan for themselves, but they draw upon a plan based on the needs of people, aspirations of people of that particular economy or the global economy. So the moment you say this, can we really continue to look at GDP as an indicator of development? Because by and large, people look at GDP per capita or real GDP per capita as indicator of levels of living in different countries and make international comparisons in the absence of alternative. Of course, you can always say Amartya Sen has given us human development index. There are now new indices like human poverty index and happiness index and whatnot. All have come. But conventionally, most countries have been looking at World Development Report or World Bank, etc. mostly looks at GDP per capita as an indicator of levels of development and then makes international comparisons either at purchasing power parity terms Definitely at constant prices, comparable unit of measurement like US dollar or euro, etc. But then there are limitations of that. 
So therefore, we switch over from simple GDP to eco domestic product or what is now known as popularly known as green GDP. Initially, it was called eco domestic product because GDP stands for gross domestic product. Where the green GDP is defined in terms of traditional macroeconomics is nothing but it is NDP minus imputed environmental costs where NB NDP stands for net domestic product. What is net domestic product which is gross domestic product minus depreciation of the man made capital, the wear and tear of the machinery for instance, the replacement cost of the equipments. So that is depreciation, so depreciation allowance. So GDP minus depreciation gives you the net domestic product. And if you deduct imputed environmental cost from a net domestic product, you get what is GDP. Initially, when this was proposed, you know, first they brought in what they call SEEA, System of Environmental and Economic Accounting. It is still debated by Government of India in CSO, Central Statistical Organization. Several countries in the world met in Rio de Janeiro, World Health Summit in 1992, and then they said, let us now move into SEEA so that we can compare. But then some countries got frightened. They said, if we estimate G green GDP, if the IEC input annual cost is higher than NDP, our GDP can become negative or it can be very low. Then they will go down low in international ranking on development. They were not really ready to accept that. But it took long enough time for people to have a consensus on this. Let us say, let, okay, let us make a beginning. So the first step, now it became quite complicated in terms of measurement like using input output table and others. But I am going to tell you very simple introduction to what exactly initially they started off with and then that is how they have been estimated also because the later me measures are still being discussed and uh, arrived upon for all the countries in the world. So the only thing that is because NDP, depreciation, GDP all data is available with CSO. So what is not available? The imputed environmental cost. What is imputed environmental cost? It is a degradation and depletion of natural assets. That is what this is the cost of that or value of that. How do we do that? So the IEC consists of you know, economic costs induced by, for example, natural resource depletion, destruction of the ecosystems, as well as degradation of natural assets, as well as you know, uh, and uh, air and water pollution, for instance, uh, etc. So we look at each of this. How exactly we calculate IEC? Some sense they will also give an idea how to value the natural resources that you were asking me in the first talk. Let us look at the resource depletion. For resource depletion, basically you have to start by calculating the rate of depletion. And then for produced natural assets like forests, the cost of depletion is set to equal to the reproduction cost of the net reduction of resources. How long does it take to get a tree back of this shape that you are cutting today? And what is the cost that you had incurred to grow this particular tree? That becomes the I mean then if you spread that over next 20 years that becomes your rate of depletion that is the cost of depletion. Suppose the resource is non-renewable makes your life difficult. Renewable you can do this but consumption of non-renewable resource may eventually require a substitute to be found. So you do not know the cost of the substitute. You do not even know the cost of discovering the substitute. Therefore in such cases you bring in what is called the user cost or in economic terms we call it depletion premium. So what is user cost? The user cost defined as the difference between rent in economic sense is not simply rent that you pay for house or you know premise that you rent out etc. Rent is a payment made for use of a particular resource. So the difference between the rent of the current resource exploitation and the external rent if we are to exploit the resource forever, assuming that the resource is available perennially infinitely and what is the rate of the use of extraction of this now today crude oil is an example here. So user cost is equal to RC minus RE where RC is the current annual rent of the resource exploitation and RE is the rent if annual rent if you could exploit the resource infinitely. In that together the total rent will now become the sigma RC is equal to 1 plus R simple discounting method where R is the discount rate and N is the number of years we could exploit the resource at the current depletion rate if it is limited. Of course, uh, 1 up to infinity if it is available forever. This is exactly what we can rent. To our. So that is we basically calculate TR E minus TR C, that is TR E basically talking in terms of when the resource is available infinitely. 
So, in other words by substituting these equations we basically get user cost as R C into 1 to the power 1 plus R to the power minus N. So, the simple discounting rate is what we basically tend to use for every resource which is now made available by several of these funding agents. So, for the resource that is finite in use non renewable one can use the user cost approach. So, you can get the you know values of this. What about the other components of IEC? Losses caused by degradation of natural assets, but here there are two important things. There are you know one is economic assets. We look at forest, grasslands and cultivable land as economic assets, but given the mindset problem that we have we look at air and water as non-economic assets. Is it correct to call them non-economic assets? Highly debatable. So, in the case of economic assets very easy to calculate, but in the case of non-economic asset like air and water how do we do it? So, the quantify the degradation cost in the monetary terms use the recovery cost as a proxy for the degradation damage. So, natural assets one can look at the rate of degradation and then impute the value, but what about air and water? So, the degradation of air and water is mainly attributed to increase in air and water pollution. For example, rising emissions of SO2, TSP, NOx and other reservoir impair air quality especially in the urban areas. So, if you look at the IEC for air that is imputed environmental cost for air and water one can use the abatement and control cost as a measure for the damage incurred by air pollution. So, for water apply the marginal abatement cost as a proxy for cost of water pollution. So, it is the cost of the exchequer who sort of regulates it and abatement that becomes air and water pollution the imputed environmental cost. So, that is also being monitored and estimated and therefore, we get what is called GDP. So, this makes people think are you really estimating green GDP or are you estimating damage cause because everywhere you are talking about what happened to the you know adverse effect and all that. So, I must say IEC and the environmental damage represent two different approaches to determining the social cost of environmental degradation. We do not want to call it damage because for some reasons why for example, in the case of air and water pollution the IEC evaluates the social cost in terms of expenditure to prevent pollution emission, whereas the environmental damage method measures them on the basis of actual losses in production and the medical expenditure or social cost that the society has to bear due to pollution. So, we are not talking about damage estimation here, we are talking in terms of cost social cost which is expenditure to prevent pollution emission, because we cannot impute value to loss of human lives and work days lost due to health problems etcetera that may make your GDP even negative. So, let me give a simple example here. Suppose we have to estimate the loss to the economy because of loss of human lives due to Bhopal gas tragedy or earthquake or several other even man made uh, you know instances like terror attack and all that. And if you have to you know see what if these people have been alive for a number of years what they were working on how much they would have been made and how much contribution they would have made to GDP and you say attribute value to that and subtract from the GDP that is damage estimation we cannot really get into that. The idea here is to talk in terms of cost to prevent pollution because these things are not what is attempted here in imputed environmental cost does not include that. Very difficult to include social losses because if you include all the social losses the acceptance of animal damage is much more expensive than the cost required to eliminate animal pollution. Therefore, we have to be very clear about this and then talk more in terms of how to operationalize sustainable development. We let us estimate input environmental cost and see how we can operationalize it. Operationalizing sustainable development within this framework is the responsibility of the policy maker and the administrator because market alone is not expected to do this. So, we expect a very important role played by the policy maker, but how do they do it? Is it possible to have modeling econometric modeling can modeling be the answer? several of these questions come up let us look at them. So, let me start with the modeling first what do we mean by economic modeling is proper short and long term trade off between economic objectives and changes in the natural resource base information on economic and environmental variables has to be comparable and the interaction between these variables correctly identified very important what happens if the steel production goes up by 10 percent to the environment what happens to when the you know oil uh, uh, production goes up or coal production goes up etcetera or usage of coal goes up all this possible using an input output transaction matrix for the economy is possible to look at all this to estimate you know green GDP whether we are on sustainable path etcetera. But remember that environmental degradation does not come up in only one way 
it can manifest in number of ways. Firstly, we all know that it can manifest in terms of rising concentration of pollution. So, we say how to deal with it. Secondly, it can also cause in terms of resource depletion. And thirdly, it can intrude into or modification of the ecosystem, like building physical infrastructure into or through them on the coast. So, it can manifest in number of ways. These environmental degradation have to be linked with the development process. So, it is linked with a range of features, processes and agents in the natural environment and society, which can be classified in five different ways. Firstly, we need to understand, all economies will have to understand, what is the source of the environmental pressure, which will vary across economies. Is it increase in economic activity like automobiles and chemicals or is it because of certain other factors? What is the source of environmental pressure? If it is because of economic increase in economic activity, it may be inevitable because economic activity will have to keep on growing for the economy to grow, become developed country. Then how do we, can we change the economic activity away from automobiles and chemicals to certain other sectors? That could be a possibility. So it's important that we document this, which sector is putting how much pressure on the environment. This includes when you are inviting multinationals and others, when your own industries have been given freedom to invest, they may invest in those sectors which have great demand. But overproduction of them can be harmful for the environment. So therefore, we have to link between source of economic pressure, activity expansion and source of economic pressure. Secondly, who are the receptors of this environmental degradation? Are they ecosystems like wetlands? Are they cultural objects like your ancient temples or Taj Mahal, etc.? Or are they people, especially those who are living at the margin, slum dwellers? We have to understand who these receptors are. The receptors could vary from situation to situation. So we have to identify who are the affected people in all these areas, which do where economic expansion is taking place. Thirdly, we also need to understand the intermediate environmental process, which links the source to receptor. For example, the rag pickers in urban areas was affected. In generators or waste treatment plants, for instance, they're all the intermediaries. So it's important to understand this classification. Fourthly, the around people are not going to take it as it is. There will be feedback agents or response by social agents. Do they have opportunity to expand? Do they have opportunity to give feedback? How exactly they do that is also something that we need to understand. And finally, the social determinants of economic activity. Because economic activity may itself expand because of growth in livestock or growth in population, which makes it inevitable. So all these aspects we need to understand in order to plan for a particular economy, to place them on environmental uh, sustainable development. Next step here in, in formulating a road map for development, especially to achieve sustainable development, is we need to understand the indicators of change in the environment. That is to capture the various aspects of change in the environment caused by economic activities. Three types of indicators are there. There are pressure indicators, impact indicators and sustainability indicators. Let us know what they are. In economic macroeconomics, we say there is a distinction between stocks and flows. Pressure indicators are mostly taken as flow variables. These are developments over a period of time of the levels of emission, uh, discharges, uh, you know, uh, depositions, extractions, interventions of originating from a set of economic activities, etc. So basically they explain the burden placed on, placed on the stocks of environmental goods and services. By and large the problem comes only in pressure, not in the basic stock. Stock is not fortunately very high for most countries. It is the flow that has become very important. And flow varies from season to season also. So they can be defined in terms of economic actors or economic sector, etc. They can also be in terms of spatial or geographical dimension, which part, which region, more concentrated, where the pressure is more, etc. And emissions can also be imported or exported by the direction of the wind. So you can say what happens in India affects Bangladesh and vice versa and the like, especially in landlocked countries. So it's important to understand the pressure indicator. Then let's move into the impact indicator, which reflect the impact of this pressure on the receptors. Usually in a predetermined region, a particular place, say a particular state, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, you know, Mizoram, etc. They also include imported transboundary pressures, and they show the development over time of the stocks and quantities of innumerable goods and resources. All that is being looked into here. Then comes finally sustainability indicators. Both the first two are both the first and second are easy to sort of measure, but that is pressure and impact and can be transformed into sustainability indicator only by relating it to some predetermined reference value. 
these references try to indicate what is considered to be a sustainable level of extraction quantity as well as quality for coal for oil and several others what is sustainable and how are you performing with respect to that how do we do this also i will give the example of israel when i went to that 3 years ago israel was discovered to have one of the largest a country which has the larger resource of gas so the government wanted to decide whether we should extract more gas now and then sell it to the world to make more money or should we decide on the rate of extraction and leave it for the future population also so that there is gas uh, exploration over a long period of time they do not know because current population we can only take decision for current government can only take decision for current population how much they will worry about future etc so they decided to go for a public consultation so they went in for this consultation with the stakeholders and finally decided what is the optimal rate of exploit at the uh, of the resources so the consensus was built in a country like israel initially i couldn't believe then when they documented they showed me all the documents how exactly they went about doing it i was very impressed how they did the consultation process in in a democratic country that's exactly what uh, is important where stakeholder pers- perception is also taken into account so it's important that you draw upon what is the what is the, because this resource can be a major turn of for an exchange for them today but they can also help them over a long period of time but the problem with sustainability indicator is that it has to it will have certain normative value because most of them picture the distance between current reference value and what should be that should be bridged who standard for instance so these reference values are of course based on scientific insights and they inevitably the outcome of personal and societal risk assessments and preferences but the risk assessment itself can vary across countries unfortunately how do we respond when two people die in a particular event and 200 people die in a particular event in a different event we do respond differently because how much do you value life of a citizen of a country it does vary for what has happened in bhopal in 1984 the company would have had to wind up with all its operation and assets attached if it had happened in us the company continues to run on indian soil although taken over by someone else and the compensation we all know the sad state of affairs with respect to the compensation the people have received so societal risk assessments and preferences are also vary across nations therefore when you talk about sustainability normative valuation does bring in and there are also problems of valuation aggregation so we have to keep that also in mind so therefore when you talk about sustainability it the perception can also vary across nations still one should go out and do it i'm not saying that therefore we should not do it Still, one to but one should be aware of the limitations of this. Therefore, one gets into what is called economic ecological modeling. Why do we talk about modeling? Because this is to just give substance to the notion of system development. If you don't, you know, say that you can sort of model it, model it, etc., people will say it's all simply words. It is possible to scientifically approach and find a solution to these issues. So we try to make a distinction between formal and analytical model here that typically provide abstract representation of the system. and empirical or applied model that relates with concrete realities there are models which are evaluative prescriptive or normative models and some of the examples of this are what is often used is cost benefit analysis cost effectiveness environmental impact analysis etc social impact analysis also so all these models are basically used in order to check whether what we are doing is uh, you know is correct step or not all these steps are being taken that into account they can also be analytical or predictive model for example one can use computable general equilibrium models or input output models or econometric models as many researchers have done in order to prescribe and now people are started engaging in simulation also so basically the models only describe the intensity of abatement or remedial activities necessary to comply with some standard of the environmental quality in relation to the cost of such activity okay sometime we also get in for the partial impact model not the complete impact model and therefore these models can be grouped into substance and material flow model or resource regeneration and carrying capacity model or life support and ecosystem models all this a lot of researchers have started getting into is only those who want to research can use any of this for their future purposes so therefore we come back we come back to simple steps that need to be taken to operationalize sustainable development and it's important that we spend some time and this will also sort of give the pathways for development first and foremost every country will have to identify 
appropriate existing abatement technologies available in them in their country or available elsewhere and direct the investment especially in r and d for the emergence of more appropriate technology in areas where it doesn't exist so one has to carry out a technology needs assessment search analysis and then investment and then direct your r and d for that is r and d directed in those line on those lines where we have capable of doing or should we it be more and more need based here they are saying that it is important that we address divert some resources for need based R&D also especially from pollution abatement technology point of view and reward if required. So as a, first, as a part of that people will say what about recycling or decrease waste generation. Recycling to decrease waste generation and reduce the use of input such as energy per unit of output is very very important you improve the awareness you talk about that. But that cannot substitute the investment to be made in R&D searching for new technology. And we cannot say that this will be done with developed countries, we will only copy and paste them or borrow them or buy them as and when we require. Every country will have to do it, they have to do their bit to contribute because sustainable, achieving sustainable development for themselves will also do good for the rest of the countries in the world. So is for others, they will also have to start thinking in the same way because you are achieving development and it is also going to be confirming to sustainability. So therefore, the first two steps as part of the first one is to invest in R&D, secondly to talk about educate people about need to recycle and decrease waste generation, especially optimal use of energy etc. Now in the Israel that I talked about when I went everybody was talking about how to reduce energy consumption per capita. So I made the change in the monotony I said I am going to talk about energy poverty. They all looked at me and said you are going to talk about energy poverty when we are all talking about reducing how to reduce energy per consumption per capita. I said I cannot talk about reducing consumption where the energy is not provided. How many villages in India do not have access to energy, electricity and gas for instance. So what happens when there are extreme events, energy poverty. So well, it is important that we talk about that. Second step here is creating a climate for the adoption of appropriate technology that is very important. How do we do it? Through the use of market based interventions not force, stick does not work all the time. Market based intervention including fiscal intervention, by fiscal policy we mean tax and subsidies. You are providing tax holidays to software exporting companies for 10 years extend to another 5 years because you need foreign exchange. Are you extending tax holiday for industries which are adopting environmentally benign practices? Are you giving subsidy to companies which are investing in R&D to search for environmentally benign technologies, reducing the emissions or those who have waste disposal plants or those who collectively work towards creating common effluent treatment plants. These are the various instruments that one could use rather than continue to use the traditional incentives for export, you know, subsidy and uh, fertilizer subsidy and like. I am not saying against them but basically it is also important to incentivize this environmentally benign steps. Third and fourth most uh, you know equally important is identify situations in which development and preservation are complementary through consumer awareness, eco friendly products, eco industries etc. It is very important. A number of steps taken by for example IIT Bombay or other institutions that I have seen in Maharashtra that during uh, you know Ganesh Chaturthi time they encourage people to use soil in and around the lakes and others to make Ganesha and then put it back to the same water body after the Ganesh festival ends eco friendly products, provide lot of incentives to the eco industry so that they won't be able to survive. You are provided to other industries in the first four decades of development, why not to eco industries now? Now it is consumer awareness where I am always you know that when do we start? What is the right age if you start that you can have an impact? There is no answer but let me give you my you know experience, personal experience of what happened in other countries. I lived in Japan for a year in 2002, between 2000-2001. The environmental awareness 15 years ago was taught not in college, not in the university, not in the university, not in the college, not in the high school etc. But in play schools, it starts from there, from nursery, pre-KG, till the age of 7 the children are not taught alphabets, till the age of 7 they are not taught alphabets, after 6 only they start telling them, 7 only they start writing A, B, C. But definitely they are taught how to segregate waste when they are in kindergarten. So same habits, old habits die hard we say you know, same habits continue till their death. So sensitization and awareness starts from nursery. Segregation of waste, begin from there, biodegradable, toxic, recyclable, taught at that level. So where do we start? Start from wherever you can, so that they are consumer awareness improves over a period of time. So it means environmental education is very important, that is why I guess all of us are together 
in these two weeks, trying to learn ourselves as well as what we think about how to you know translate this to our students. Fourthly, encourage in all areas where it implies preservation. Preservation cannot simply become your universal mantra, but where it requires, where it implies preservation, you must encourage. That will, because if you just say only preserve, preserve, then you, are, you may not achieve development. So, where it requires, where it, is, it means, it is meaningful, useful, encourage. But uh, is there anybody who is listening, who is following all this? Yes. Look at the experience the last 25 years. You can see the Rio meeting was the Waterloo. Pre and post Rio meeting. Before 1992, there was very little awareness about global warming and depletion of resources. But leading to 1992 Earth Summit, several regional comprehensive economic and environmental plans were prepared because they wanted to make an impressive presentation in the Rio summit. Post Rio, almost every country decided that they will embark on this, although they, everybody, each one of them took different time. Some example of what people did before 92, countries in Latin America and Caribbean came together and followed what is called our own agenda for sustainable development, regional sustainable development plan and they made a presentation in Rio summit. Southeast Asia came up with another one, economic policy for Southeast Asia, South, sustainable development, Southeast Asia in 1990. Pacific, countries in Pacific Island came up with environment and development as Pacific perspective. They called it the Pacific way in 1991, they also prepared. So they all gave different perspectives to all this. But what we find uh, from them as well as from what has happened post Rio summit, we can talk about Kyoto Protocol, one can talk about other international uh, you know, agreements, etc. There is a difference in the perspective between developed and developing countries, no doubt about it. It is bound to be there, whether you are talking in terms of food subsidy, you are talking in terms of green box subsidies or you are talking in terms of pollution management, pollution control, foreign direct investment open trade, monetary fiscal policy, in each of this there could be difference in perception. But that does not mean that we should leave it there, there can be difference in perception, that is fine. As long as the objective are similar or comparable or are the same, then these differences in perceptions are fine. It is not necessary that everybody will have to follow the same path, they can follow different paths. But all roads, all paths may go to lead to the same destination, that is destination of sustainable development. It is also important that every country understands that animal degradation may be an inevitable consequence of development, but not necessarily is a harbinger of doom, because it is reversible after certain threshold levels. Number of studies who have formulated and estimated environmental Kuznets curve hypothesis for various countries in the world have come to this conclusion that it is reversible after certain threshold levels. But it may take some time for different countries to achieve that threshold, until then you may have to have the patience. And you can always work towards it because the threshold after threshold declining in you know in pollution level is not automatic. It can be triggered, you can even trigger it faster. So where did you take steps for that? But then the question is, are we going to have enough resources for investing in all this? But aren't you wasting resources? How much of money is being wasted? We say in food subsidy, out of every hundred rupees spent by the government, how much is really reaching out to the poorest of the poor? Fifteen or sixteen rupees? Remaining 84, 85 rupees goes only in implementing that. Same thing may be holding to with respect to environmental subjects also. So it is important that we save some of this for and then spend it on through the right institution for the right purpose. So what has definitely happened in the last two decades, it has provided an attractive research agenda for developed countries. Plethora of journals, plethora of you know research papers that have been published covering various dimensions in this. Same is also emerging in the case of developing countries, no doubt about that. You can see all that is happening. So, in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I thought I will talk more about specifically on India. So, I thought best is to start with energy. There is no doubt that there is a big gap between demand and supply for energy. Demand is always higher than supply and we are always trying to see how we can achieve the demand target. Demand is you know basically estimated based on the requirements of industry, households, commercial, other purposes, etc. And this demand supply mismatch is going to be you know a big issue, has been a big issue for many years and is going to grow. How do we address this mismatch? It is a big challenge. Now in this process, we are also trying to learn from other countries experience. How do the others try to do that? Because the mismatch seems to be getting reduced for them, but it seems to be not getting reduced for us at all. So maybe they are going in switching over to more efficient modes of energy generation, nuclear, but after Chen Boil, especially after what happened in Fukushima, people are scared. Solar, definitely possible, environmentally benign, but expensive. A lot of now investment is directed towards R&D in solar in India and other places. So we are 
on the one hand there is a problem of mismatch in demand and supply on the other hand it is also important that we manage our power plants better so that they are they do not they are not the major source of pressure on the environment. And here when it comes to energy we are not saying that you know conservation is a wrong phrase where required conservation should be encouraged. But one cannot talk too much about conservation when there is energy poverty. Have you given access to electricity or energy resources across the length and breadth of the country? No. Then how can I talk about conservation in general? I will talk about conservation in select areas where it is used extensively. So, I have to also address the issue of energy poverty which is related to economic poverty. So, the first and foremost is the way we deal with the problem of energy understanding these dimensions. Second is what about water? Many studies have shown that we are running out of water, normal and clean water and with monsoons getting postponed, irregular, unseasonal etc. We may have face more such problems in future climate change. How are we going to take care of this? Desalinization could be a measure but can they really bring a solution to a large country like us? Now people are saying, saying that we will use solar power for desalinization, very good thing. A lot of research has been funded by DST on this. Third dimension is in terms of land degradation. We seems to have come into a situation where we are unable to feed ourselves. We are also depending more and more on food imports. Is it by choice or is it because we are, our lands are getting diverse to cultivation of others which we are using for oil seeds and others which are now using for energy purposes or export purposes. And there is a big issue of biodiversity which also results in land degradation. How are we going to handle? So that is again another set of things that we need to look at. Not to say they are not interrelated. There is a close interrelation between them, but each one of it is a different dimension. And fourthly, and I am not saying this is in terms of order of priority, I am just saying that these are the issues that is coming up here, urban squalor, unplanned urbanization and slow sluggish growth of the rural economies attracts migration to urban areas. So, it results in urban squalor and there are issues of choking or on polluted air, Delhi as studies have shown or other cities in India, less urban, not necessarily only in metropolitan city, but also in other areas. So, these are the major threats. So, we need to address all of them. So, it has to be addressed in your approach to development itself. This is not to say, so what are the policies in action? What are the road maps that we can offer for development? What exactly action that we can have? This is not to say that we are doomed forever. A rapid growth for Indian economy is definitely possible. I am always a pessimist, possible, optimistic. And the resources also exist. We have, but what we need to understand is are we giving directing enough technological efforts? Are we promoting technological efforts to answer to find solution to our own growth requirements? The answer is no. It is not that we do not have the skilled workforce or you know technically and skilled scientifically skilled manpower to do that. The proportion of GDP that is invested in R and D, if you take all public, private, everybody together, has not has just marginally been above one percent of GDP. You look around the world. Many countries that have progressed very well have invested about 4 percent. Now, the question is suppose I enhance the investment, will that take care? Not at all. Is it important to only look at US and Europe for exam? Not at all. You look at Japan. What has worked in Japan? They also adopted import and adapt technology. But then soon they became threat to the original technology supplier, team effort, industry and government came together to do R&D. Right from 1950s, we never emphasize, although it remains on paper, some tech incentives are there, emphasize the importance given to R&D. Whenever we open up the economy, we go abroad, we say, please give the technology, we want to import. And if you started the industry in 1960s by importing technology, in 1980s when you open up, the, again you go back to the same guy and say, can you give me updated technology? What have you been doing in the last 20 years with the technology that I gave you? Those guys will not ask you because they are getting money for supplying the upgraded technology. What have you done? There is no pressure on me. There is no pressure of competition. Now there is pressure of competition since 1991. So I am directed to do R&D. But again, there is no pressure on me to be environmentally to search for environmentally benign technologies. Again, pressure alone will not bring about this. There has to be pressure from within, not from just the government policy or the regulator alone. That will come only when you sensitize them towards. So we have the advantage of working with young minds, our students. So, when you try to attempt this, we expect at least even 10 percent of them get sensitized and start working towards that. It will help us as well as the entire humanity all over the world. So, that is why it is important to talk about technological effort. Are there enough incentives that we can articulate and demand from the government? It is important that we put on paper, put on you know in practice. 
incentives for that. There are green labeling that is required when you export. We may fulfill our exporters will fulfill, but there is nothing for the domestic market. People say it's very expensive. But when it has to be export market, you are ready to face that. There are green labels, there are green shares. Companies which adopt sustainable practices are their shares are traded differently in New York Stock Exchange. Please do a Google search on green shares. Same company share is traded elsewhere, also green shares. That is how the stock market treats them. Suppose we start that, well, I don't know what will happen to Indian industries. How many of them really follow green practices? Some may follow, but they may not really document, but many may not follow at all. To get them qualified to get green labeling for the plant as a whole. ISO certification is an attempt in that direction. CDMs, clean development mechanisms, adoption of that is also an attempt in that direction. CDMs also help you get the technology transfer from elsewhere. So we are doing some research on what happens to the company which are fulfilling ISO certification which also are basically getting to CDMs, etc. And see, compare them with others. It's important that we identify them as champions. We have to move away from the mindset of, you know, rewarding those who achieve high rates of growth, high rates of profits alone. They're important. I'm not saying they're unimportant. But if they can combine that with environmentally benign practices, these are the ones we need to be rewarded. Do we have anything on place as of date? Any policy, any provision to reward them, unfortunately not. That is why it is important to promote technological effort. In fact, what is happening here is even the universities are ranked in terms of the green practices in US. They separate ranking. We are talking about QS ranking and others of the institutions and universities, etc. in terms of publications where your students get placed and all that. But we are also, also talking about green campuses. So therefore, what I want to say is to preserve the quality of environment. It is high time India we give special attention to policies to place itself on sustainable growth path rather than simply on development path. So high time we achieve <laughs> instead upon that. Once we do that, then we will see the results may not come tomorrow. Results will definitely take some time to come. But when it comes, it will be a very pleasant, livable experience for us as well as for the future generation. That is exactly what it is important that for us to uh, highlight and understand. Some specific instruments and policies is what I intend to take up in the future sessions, but this is exactly what I wanted to uh, state it here. So now I would like to use the next half an hour for uh, interaction. Yeah, I have a question that it is a trend that we see that uh, different countries or developed countries have uh, from the primary sector to the secondary sector as well as the third, uh, third sector that is the tertiary sector. Now India is such a country which has shifted from directly from agriculture to service sector. So based on that, I have two questions regarding this. Uh, one is, uh, how will it help in development of like sustainability development? And the next question is, what adverse effect will it have on the environment? Good, very good question. Uh, I agree that we have shifted from there, but that's morely, mostly in terms of uh, share of GDP as well as the growth rates. But this is not to say that industry has not been growing in India. Industry has also actually been growing. and. Uh, all, see, we put maximum effort to plan for industrialization and that is really not really in terms of the environmental point of view. Planning has been only for increasing investment and production in industries. So the challenges posed by fast growing service sector for the environment are much different and much lower than challenges posed by uh, the growth of uh, industrial sector. But the problem have come to a very serious level today in India because, I mean, manageable but serious, is because the industrialization itself did not, you know, uh, take into account environmental, environmental perspective at all. Even over, I'm not saying 1956 we should have taken into account, but at least 1996 we should have taken that into account. So that is why there's a differential. It's at least now it's time for us to wake up when we say. We need to come, we need to have more and more make in India uh, slogans. Especially when you say we want to invite them to come and make in India. We have to see which sector is going to come here. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, I want to know a practical example of impact indicator. Impact indicator, health expenditure on cardiovascular disease. Okay, sir. Thank you. 1241 NRI Institute. Sir, can we display a model environment before the policy makers for valuation? Yes, it is possible. Thank you, sir. SKN, Singhagad. Hello, sir. 
Yes, go ahead. My we can question hear you. is that uh, how the sustainable development can be achieved in the rural areas of India? It's a good point. In fact, when I talked about uh, sustainable development, it means it refers to both urban as well as rural areas only. Okay. Now, although I did not elaborate much about the agriculture practices, but in the morning session, we talked about what are the agriculture practices which can have adverse environmental impacts. So, that is what we expect it to be addressed here. Regarding agriculture, how the food security and uh, the agricultural sustainability can be related with each other? Of course, the, that's a, it's a big challenge linking food security with agriculture uh, uh, sector. Uh, with globalization, food security is also now sort of uh, possible to achieve through uh, your trade. Whereas agricultural uh, diversity and sustainability can be uh, attempted in most countries in, uh, independent of that. One can try that as well. Okay, sir. Thank you. Maratwada Institute. I want to ask one question in that, see, India is trying to imply the policy of make in India. Yes. If, the, if this implies, if this policy will be adopted, then industries will increase in India, in number of industries. It will, uh, will it, it adversely affect India? And uh, even if it have, uh, affect India, I want to ask one more relative question that, why don't we import then? If the, and why is the import also not, not good for our Indian economy? Have you got it, sir? Yes, I got it. Thank you for the good questions. Okay, make in India is good. We should never say it's bad because make in India is good because we need to provide employment opportunities to people here. If you want to import, it will be made elsewhere, employment opportunity and the benefit of that will go to other countries. So, make in India is definitely going to be good. It will add to industrialization. So, we, I will never advocate, you know, importing commodities which we can make in India. Okay. But having said that, when you say make in India campaign, we must ensure that the industries that we are going to be coming up now are following environmentally benign practices. Our regulator will have to ensure that. It should not become relocation of most pollution intensive industries from US or Germany to India. That is what our apprehension is. So, if you can ensure, government can ensure this, it is well and good. Rajaramabu Institute. In terms of environmental economics, I just want to ask one question. We have to correlate the economics related to rural area as well as the uh, urban area. Because in terms of urban area, we are going to provide the all types of uh, the raw materials from the uh, source of rural area. So, is there any correlation in between uh, these two things or else we have to separate these two things? No, no, you are correct. We need to correlate, we need to understand the interlinkages between agriculture and industries, which used to be very strong earlier and it is getting reduced now, but there are several agro based, the several industry which are dependent on agriculture for inputs. So, it is very important we understand the sectoral linkages within an economy. It is still important. PSG College. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. How pollution is affecting our economy? Is there any case study? Yes, there are a number of case studies that people have done. I have also done some case studies on how it is affecting in different uh, parts of it. Some of it I will be talking to you in the, uh, in the class tomorrow, especially in the context of climate change. What are the cities affected by pollution in our country and how government is mitigating such pollution? Oh, what are the cities affected? The list is already there. Look at the environment, Ministry of Environment and Forest, the list is there. Delhi tops the list. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. More questions, sir. Uh, sir, my question is from previous session. Uh, can you explain about the which one, land tenure pattern? Land tenure pattern deals with the kinds of tenancy system we have and ten kinds of share cropping system that we have between the owners and the cultivators. That is what we mean by you know land tenure system. What are the contractual agreement that is entered between the landlord and the cultivator? So, can you explain about the socio-economic values? Socio-economic impact assessments that we try, tend to do for most of the projects become mandatory now. So, that you know wh who is going to be affected, how are they going to be affected and in terms of benefits to the uh, society as well as the economy. All this being going to be assessed before you decide to support that particular project or policy. Impact on society and economy. R.C. Patel, Shirpur. Good afternoon, sir. 
Good afternoon. My question is, what are the policies that is to be implemented to give permission for a particular mining project in the biosphere reserve? There is another question which is related to microeconomics and micro macroeconomics. How can correlate microeconomics issues with the macroeconomics issues? Can you explain with a suitable case study? Sure. See, uh, let me take the second question first. Uh, micro and macro uh, are, you know, what happens to in a particular, uh, say, farm, say, which is cultivating paddy, and the farmer is switching over from paddy to, say, jetropa. Okay, so we look at in terms of microeconomic effect. But if one farmer does it, is it necessary that all farmers in that region will have to switch over to that? And if they do, what will happen to food security in India, and the impact on environment, etc. So that's where the link between one farm and farming in general. So what holds true for one individual may not hold true for everybody, but if everybody does it, what will happen to the economy? That is where we try to link, in, you know, link between micro and macro system in a very, in a very simple example uh, I state that. With respect to coal mining, there are number of steps, procedures that are being established for that also. You know, if you look at the Singanary coal field for example, all these are documented in the website itself. The problem comes when most people do not follow it and they violate it. One another question. Yeah. Which parameters that we have to consider in evaluating environmental economics related to damages caused by the various types of pollution created by a specific project activity? We will have to see what the project is all about and whether it is going to be, whether it is water, water pollution intensive or air pollution intensive, how exactly one can assess the impact of this in that region. There are theoretical specifications, there are also practical specifications that we can definitely look into and benchmarks whether they are strictly other into etc. So, we will have to basically you know compare in terms of the norms only. Federal Institute. Previous session uh, you were speaking about uh, clustering of countries regarding the development. Correct. So, my question is, you are also speaking about policy perspectives in the, the one of the, in this session actually. Mm. So, when a country is basically planning on uh, strategies for development, uh, how effective and how good it will be uh, regarding the environmental protection policies when we consider the global scenario? Definitely. See, you, you do not operate independently today because the globalization, your economy is linked to the economies of the rest of the world. So, you are attending several, uh, you know, COPs and, uh, COP and other meetings where your signatory, your party to uh, uh, some declarations jointly signed by all the countries. So, you are supposed to bring that knowledge and implement it, incorporate it in your own planned approach to development. So, definitely we expect it to be much more, much better today than it was say 20 years ago. Sir, one of the examples is uh, when uh, US uh, basically, US and some of the other developed countries asked us to cut down the carbon dioxide emissions. Most of the developing countries they were not ready to do the same. So, that is one of the main issues or one of the main things we have to think about. So, that is a I, I, I agree. That is, that is where they bring in politics. Because what happens is the US President signs Kyoto Protocol, but when he goes back to Washington, people say, how did you sign? It is very difficult for us to adhere to these norms. So, therefore, developing countries also react saying that, look, you have signed, you cannot go back. But they, when they don't honor, obviously others also follow suit. So this is a global. That's why, right in the first class, I said it's a global public good. So you will have to decide what you will do for the global. Because every action of yours has global implications today. There is no easy solution. Our objective is to, you know, uh, imbibe this knowledge on the students and see, make them think. Line Institute. Sir, good afternoon. So my question is, in our country, is there any indigenous? Example of development without depleting environment. You mean at some region, some village, some level? You can you can see some you know sporadic cases of uh, you know environmental benign practices being adopted in select regions, but they are very micro levels. Not for a country as a whole, not for a state, or not for the uh, you know in uh, in the south north region uh, perspective. So there are sporadic cases of. I mean, or instances or examples where they followed development, which are also pathways, which are also environmentally benign. See, uh, I would say there was a study of uh, 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 Palampur in Himachal Pradesh, which sort of documents some of the best practices. 
and also there are select spaces in Madhya Pradesh. It is also uh, you know uh, uh, documented that way. So, but you know there are sporadic cases and not really in terms of followed throughout the country. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sustainable development. There should be standardized procedure just like ISO 40,000 for environmental policy. Why should uh, by governance such kind of policy be made for sustainable development? Good question. You know what happens here is when you have ISO and others, you assume that there is only one way uh, to achieve this. But sustainable development can be achieved by multiple ways also. There is no one particular single route that's, that has to be only followed. The same problem can be you know addressed by number of steps. That is exactly what I attempted to show. So that you have to, you cannot say this it is more a certification as than this. So there are a number of ways. We did a study of you know sustainable development practices being adopted in uh, two blocks in Pune district, you know, uh, in Vela and Puranda taluk of Pune district, and where it is decentralized approach that turned out to be extremely uh, fruitful. It is not top down. It is basically people who came together and then adopted certain practices. So there is no one particular method. It is outcome that is more important, and therefore. These certifications may not really be uh, applicable in the case of uh, sustainable practices. ISO certifications are fine. It is very easily followed, followable in the case of industry or manufacturing sector, but not necessarily if you talk about economy as a whole. Birla Institute. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, uh, we are taking sustainable development, but on the other hand, we are doing it intentionally and knowingly for personal benefits. For example, nowadays uh, uh, gadgets life has been reduced to three years or five years. Earlier it was made for lifetime. So it is ultimately pressurizing on natural resources. So how government will uh, come up with this issue? Very, very good. I want to thank you for this question. Actually, you hit the correct nail. Now, this is from the development point of view, from the corporate growth point of view, they want to reduce the product life cycle so that you know we buy more and more and the companies continue to strive more and more, etc. But it results in lot, generation of a lot of e-waste, I agree. So your, your question is, are we not knowingly do this? Yes, there is always a conflict between private interests, personal interests, business interest and the larger public, societal and government interest. So the entire, if there is no conflict, you and I do not need to be there to worry about this. So we are here worried about it only because of this conflict and how to resolve this conflict. It is not easy, but we are still have to make attempt, whereby the private sectors make profit at the same time worry about the environment as well. Uh, good afternoon, sir. wanted to raise a, I mean, a kind of bigger question that uh, is sustainable development an utopian or Ram Raji kind of concept? We are working on everything. And suppose if I am taking about uh, the rich north and the poor south, one says look for quality of life, other says that okay, we are looking just for life, for survival. How are we going to resolve this contradiction? Very good point. I definitely want to respond. Now, uh, it is not a utopian concept, please. It is basically we are trying, to, we, I have tried to be as pragmatic as possible when we try to approach this particular concept. Okay. Now, having said that, is it that you know North wants to have a better quality of life than and then South wants development? Yes, it is important that we achieve development and then look about it. But that's you know, if you remember in on the on the in the meeting on Friday that I told you that the Hajun Chang wrote a book called Kicking Away the Ladder. So if the present day developed countries have used some ladder to climb up and they want to kick away the ladder not to be available for the present day developing countries to use to climb up. That day I said maybe it is a, it's a bad move, but I, you know we should always look at it as a good move because that gives you an opportunity to reformulate your development approach which is sustainable. So why should we encounter the same kinds of problem that the world is encountering because of the pathways adopted by present day developed countries. If it is possible for you to avail alternative pathways which can be environmentally benign and get you development, why not? Is there anything that says you cannot achieve this? No, possible. So now the question, it may be, it may take slightly longer, it may be expensive, but it may be worth it keeping the prosperity of the posture. That is why I am saying that all the developing countries should explore. We are not giving it as a dictate. 
diktat. We are saying that it is it's possible, if it is possible one should definitely explore and then see how much we can do it. So, that we do not encounter the same problem that the present day developed countries are inquiring, entering into today and resultantly all others are also suffering because of their action. I hope I made myself clear to you. Good afternoon sir, uh, you said that prevention is better than cure, how does this uh, support the sustainable development concept? No, I said prevention is better than cure in a specific context madam. This is especially you know when it comes to pollution, pollution management. We try to see how much we can because just because we have been damaging does not mean that we will continue to damage. If it is possible for us to prevent future damages, one should definitely make an attempt. Okay. Now, uh, well can that really be implemented? So, I might go back to my earlier point to the you know question asked by the gentleman. Is it at all possible for developing countries to embark on this? Is not it going to be expensive? I agree, it is going to be difficult as well as costlier and it may take longer time to achieve the per capita income levels of the West, but it may be worth it because we have not achieved any great development in the last 60 years in any case, is not it? Have we, we are not, 60 years is a long period that we are taking still we are not reached their per capita income levels. We are not even reached their level that they were in 1950s. So, why not make alternative attempts? This I am doing, saying it for all developing countries, not just only for India, where if it is possible to achieve. And I will say as I give a taxonomy, it is possible for us to achieve. These things are not, you know, Hercule in task. We just have to have the mindset and effort directed in that uh, direction. Thank you very much.